evening all of you uh, thank you for inviting me here uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, amongst my colleagues fellow architects and also with uh, with manufacturers and product designers who have introduced into the country several innovative products and uh, you are actually changing the uh, the design input itself with uh, such a capabilities, capable product range that has come into the market. Um, <coughs> uh, thank you very much again. Uh, <coughs> I noticed that I have to uh, address on a topic uh, which is aesthetics versus economy. Uh, I, I first didn't read that uh, topic title very clearly. I thought it was aesthetics and economics, but later I found that it was aesthetics versus economics. And I was wondering, you know, as I ended, um, I, I, my exposure to economics was uh, extremely limited. And uh, my mind went back to the period when I was a student in Loyola College, doing PUC, sometime in uh, 1959. And uh, what I remember most about that economic subject just to tell you how much I understand of that, was that Lalakaji had a wonderful mess. So the afternoon lunch was really very nice. And then our class, economics class, used to be in the second floor of Lila College. Those days, city was rather not highly built up. And we used to get a sea breeze at about 2.30 at second floor. Wonderful breeze. After a wonderful lunch, half the students will be asleep. Other half will be trying to avoid going to sleep. And uh, especially when the professor was teaching a subject called uh, economic theory. It's called uh, law of uh, diminishing returns. His theory was that uh, if you invest in a product and you get a good return, a satisfying return, if you keep on investing the same product, the returns are not likely to be the same as the first time. And uh, he gave an example saying that if you eat, uh, if you drink a first cup of coffee, it's very nice. So you order a second cup of coffee. It's nice, but not to the extent of your first coffee. Then you keep on drinking fifth, sixth, seventh cup. By the eighth cup, you're fed up. So the theory was that uh, as you reinvest in something that's, uh, uh, that you once thought was good, it's going to be disastrous. So this, that is my exposure to economics. And uh, one more part I must talk about this is that uh, in a question time, he asked, can you give an example? He asked the boy, can you give an example in real life of the law of diminishing return? So the boy stood up and said, sir, first 15 minutes of your lecture was very interesting. The second 15 minutes went down, and now we are sick of your class. <laughs> so anyway, that's so. So I, I I, I, it's wondering uh, how to relate these two topics, uh, aesthetics and economics. And uh, you can speak both ways. You can also speak aesthetics and economics, or aesthetic versus economics. But if you ask a purist, purist designer or a purist architect, he'll be aghast by this uh, topic that one, uh, a designer can get an opportunity to choose at the time of designing, between aesthetics and economics. You go and ask an, uh, an architect, look, did you design the building with economics in mind or with aesthetics in mind? You'll surely get a slap back. Um, a couple is laughing at me, but uh, you know, I, I don't think people approach a design project like this. Yes, they will look for economy in construction, but not at the expense of the design input that goes into the building. You, you do that so that irrespective of uh, the direction of design, you either uh, you know, splurge or you don't splurge in terms of expenditure. But whether you're designing a low-cost housing or you're building a luxury apartment, uh, I don't think the design approach basically uh, to make a livable space, uh, that's not going to change. That will be constant no matter what range of buildings that one designs. I mean, this is what uh, uh, I believe 
the essence of design. And uh, therefore, I was uh, thinking, at it, thinking about how to uh, not treat it as versus, but treat it as and. I just wanted to explore what happens if you uh, treat it as both of them being intertwined. Uh, it's a very good possibility. Again, uh, there's a, fundamentally, they're very different. But at the same time, they have overlapping, uh, uh, overlapping sense. Uh, <clears throat> in the sense that, see, aesthetics uh, basically is an extremely individualistic thing. And uh, aesthetics generally comes naturally as, a, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an appreciation of what one sees or what one hears, as what one touches, feels, or, you know, the, that's, that's what causes a sense of satisfaction, a sense of uh, fulfillment in a person, and uh, a thing of uh, beauty is appreciated, or at least felt. Uh, this, this can be in any field. It can be an architectural uh, field for evaluating an aesthetics uh, of a building, or you can also look at several other arts, basically, uh, and even in uh, unconnected areas, like sports, like product design, uh, like uh, so many things. For instance, you, if you want to, you know, we architects generally get into this uh, aesthetics exposure as a, as a appreciation of aesthetics, usually, in the first, year, first semester or second semester, uh, the architects have a class which is called art appreciation class. I'm sure all of us must have gone through that art appreciation class. It's a wonderful class. They tell you all about uh, the history of art, what are the different movements, and what are the correlation between the movement, artistic movement and the context of the time, what are the influencing factors, and how the, uh, the, the uh, artists of that period contributed uh, their contributions, I mean, their uh, innovation, their uh, ideas of uh, uh, what uh, they interpreted, and that's what was presented. But the, uh, the, the, there's a high influence of context when you talk of aesthetics. And also, it's highly in, in, innate, and in a sense, it's inborn, and uh, it can also be acquired you know, by exposure. Uh, which is by training, which is what this class is all about. Just so that the students get acquired, acquainted with a uh, sense of aesthetics in a structured form. It doesn't necessarily force them or tell them that this is what you should do. But it gives them a platform so that you build on your own, uh, you know, rights and wrongs or uh, not even rights and wrongs, what is, uh, uh, what appeals to somebody or what doesn't appeal to somebody. So you get into a thing. And that's also a, a class which actually helps the student to put uh, some thought of what, uh, you know, when, when he is given a design, he gets an idea of what is uh, the direction of his design, what will be his personal uh, reaction uh, when it comes to a thing like composition or uh, a color choice or texture and so on, they, they do that. We're also exposed in the early class, uh, early in the course, uh, to a subject called theory of design, in which they talk to you about Vitruvian theory of 10 fields of architecture. And they actually denude all this proportion, color, texture, size, uh, you know, the, the whole lot of 10 books he wrote about so many things. These things are exposed. Therefore, there's an acquired a uh, sense of uh, aesthetics, uh, which forms a platform for architects to work on. And this platform becomes intuitive to the architects as they go along. They are, of course, influenced by what's happening around. And that's how they, they sort of uh, tend to be looked at as persons who, whose work can actually reflect or not reflect an aesthetical appeal to the building. It's not just visual appeal. You know, aesthetics can also be in the way a space is created, in the way one feels. How does he feel in a space? How does he feel uh, looking at the color composition? How does he feel, he or she feels, in the way um, the, the, the visual experience of the, from the building to outside and also from outside to inside? 
uh, how the spaces are linked. All this is also part of aesthetics because it actually touches the spirit of sense, spirit of uh, uh, you know fulfillment in the mind. You sort of see something very nice, and it definitely has an impact on your um, on how you react to a situation, your your sense of uh, satisfaction, and so on. In fact, aesthetics can also be expressed in different ways in different fields. For instance, you know, product design is one thing that uh, has always appealed to me. And it comes in different forms at different ages and so on. Uh, when the modern movement came in, uh, particularly in, in the product design, you know, at one time, uh, you know, as an example, I'll just give Bugatti is a car which was built during uh, the early, mid uh, 20th century. And the Bugatti styling was supposed to be so uh, good and nice that others tended to copy it. And they set a, set a standard as far as automotive design is concerned. And then, of course, it depicted certain characters. Then you also see those days early models of, uh, of Lamborghini or you see Ferrari. You, you can see the building and you can see the sense of speed. You can relate the shape and the action that it does, the speed. If you look at it that way, even today in totally unconnected field, if you see a Federer backhand, that's also fluid, absolutely fluid and absolutely beautiful. And uh, so precise, and the speed, and the transfer of power. Then if you break it down, that's a shot that one person hits a ball. But look at what comes out of that visual experience of seeing a Federer hitting a backhand winner. You feel a tremendous sense of, you know, you feel happy about it. You feel. Uh, uh, that you see something that should not have been missed. Uh, this is, you know, it goes on into several things. You see a beautiful landscape, or you see, a, um, a, a, you know, a, even, even for instance, the animal life. You see certain wonderful uh, activities of animals, which actually create a sense of, you know, awe in the sense that uh, you see an antelope running away from a predator. You see the kind of jump that it does. That jump, it runs across whatever um, uh, bushes or across rocks or whatever it is. Such a fluid movement that it has. That movement is actually so appealing and so uh, stunning. And uh, you see sense of power. You see a tiger coming. You can see raw, raw power, raw aggression. You can feel that kind of thing. You know, these, these, this way, manifestation of aesthetics is there in every field, and it can be acquired. Now, these are good parts of it, but what happens is today, uh, the, the influence of media on thrusting aesthetical sense on people. There are good features, there are also uh, features that are, you know, we are accepting unknowingly or knowingly. For instance, today's uh, media, today's uh, social media, movies and so on, are trying to influence, you know, become influencers in uh, establishing uh, what is supposed to be desirable, what is not supposed to be so desirable. And the kind of impact it has on people, particularly it has on uh, younger people, formative years. So what, what happens to this kind of influence in, in the sense that lifestyle, for instance, even lifestyle can be influenced through these media. And, uh, you know, it tends to make people think that, oh, that's what we should aim for, or that's what life is all about. So this is this kind of a, you know, the, what, what is absolutely a, a wonderful experience of, uh, you know, seeing a, a thing, as a purist will say, uh, uh, you know, touches your senses. Uh, it could also actually touch uh, parts of uh, a lifestyle which is, uh, I would say it's not, uh, uh, you know, not good for the society. I mean, this, this is also happening. We are witnessing it. Now, coming to uh, the economics theory, again, you know, I, I, I'm not knowing much about economic theory, but we only read about it. You see somebody winning a Nobel Prize in economics. Then what does the paper say, or somebody comments upon it? He says, it's a fantastically simple and... Uh, uh, you know, straight solution to
to a very complex problem. So this is what it says. If you look at some of the works, in fact, uh, uh, Albert Einstein is supposed to have said, remove the cluster and see the, see, see the clarity in a picture, that's science. So remove the clutter and see the, see the uh, true picture is what science is all about. And if you look at architecture, you have also an architect like, you know, who said almost about 50, 70, 80 years ago, Mies van der Rohe, said less is more. And that less is more is even valid today. And uh, that's almost like it touches every part of architect's uh, work. It also touches every part of life. You know, in fact, this entire sustainability has become a keystone uh, not only amongst architects, but also in all aspects of economy, all, all aspects of government policies and so on. So the, the, you, there are interconnections between, uh, you know, the kind of uh, minimalistic approach to a, to a problem, not only in architecture, not only in arts, but not only in, in lifestyle, but also in economics. A simpler theory, a simpler working model is, uh, is what eventually works according to the, uh, you know, the, the, the specialist and theorists uh, in economy. So there are a lot of interconnections between these two. Uh, this is, uh, you know, what I felt on looking at the topic. But if you say economy in terms of building cost and, you know, what do you design? Yes, that's also an important aspect that an architect does consider. But it comes at a stage after design. You know, when he's, uh, uh, when, he, when he's analyzing his own design, then he tends to see space utilization, efficiency of planning. He looks at material choices. He looks at, uh, you know, a compos he or she looks at a, a complete comprehensive uh, components that get into a building and make it work. So that, this way, uh, you know, this is where the economy and the design meet together and they work together. By economy, I mean uh, not a, you know, the economics, it's just economy. Now economy, you look at it, architect comes up with a solution. Not always it's true to say that less expensive material is not aesthetic or very highly expensive material automatically becomes expensive. That is not so. There's a thing called lifestyle cost. I mean, uh, life cycle cost. I think it would be expensive. You know, for instance, the extent of research that has gone on with the wood finish and the stainless steel that we saw, the tabletops and kitchen, enormous amount of research and development has gone into it. And it's got efficiency, it's got functional uh, characteristics, it's beautiful to look at, it's flexible, can be used in multiple ways. All these products have that character. Definitely they'll cost more. Therefore, if you look, spend more, and you get the benefit in terms of longer life, life uh, content or life duration. And eventually, if you look at the lifestyle cost, it may be economical. You know, I, generally we don't work it out, but this is the, you know, uh, perception. So I, I think uh, there's a lot of inter interconnection between economy as a wasteless, wasteful expenditure of resources, versus efficient use of resources, including money, is what all design is about. And it's also what all economy is about. So there's a lot of uh, interrelation between these two. Um, so I just, these are some random thoughts I had on this uh, topic of, uh, the, uh, 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 the topic of today's uh, uh, thing. And I'm sure the, the panel discussion that's going to follow, there'll be much more, uh, uh, you know, deeper analysis will come out of it. After all, mine was just a superficial uh, reaction to it, as I just saw it. And uh, it's wonderful to have been here and talking about uh, things that come to my mind as uh, on examining this uh, topic. And I must uh, conclude now. I must thank the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your humble thoughts and you. I request you to please stay back. I would now uh, like to invite Mr. Viresh Malan, Chief of Sales from ECA, and with uh, in Mr. Indrajit Sauji, Group Publishing Director of ITP Media Group, to kindly come on stage and felicitate our dear guest of honor.
Can we have a huge round of applause and a standing ovation for our guest of honor?